a reading from the second book of Maccabees. After Pentecost, Judas Maccabeus and his army marched against Gorgias, and the governor of Idumea. And he came out with 3,000 footmen and 400 horsemen. And when they had joined battle, it happened that a few of the Jews were slain. Later, Judas came with his company to take away the bodies of them that were slain and to bury them with their kinsmen in the sepulchres of their fathers. And they found under the coats of the slain some of the donneries of the idols of Jannia, which the law forbiddeth to the Jews. So that all plainly saw that for this cause they were slain. Then they all blessed the just judgment of the Lord, who had discovered the things that were hidden. And so, betaking themselves to prayers, they besought him that the sin which had been committed might be forgotten. But the most valiant Judas exhorted the people to keep themselves from sin. For as much as they saw before their eyes what had happened because of the sins of those that were slain. And making a gathering, he sent 12,000 drachmas of silver to Jerusalem for the sacrifice to be offered for the sins of the dead, thinking well and religiously concerning the resurrection. For if he had not hoped that they that were slain should rise again, it would have seemed superfluous and vain to pray for the dead. And because he considered that they who had fallen asleep with godliness, pietate, had great grace laid up for them, it is therefore a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead, that they may be loosed from sins. Words from the second book of Maccabees. After St. Bernadette saw the Immaculate Virgin, the Virgin Mary in the niche of the Masabiel, the first time on that memorial 11 of February, she and her sister were later beaten by their mother, Louise, who told Bernadette that she was just seeing things. After being allowed to go a second time with the needed permission coaxed from her father by Bernadette's schoolmates, the enraptured girl was physically carried off by Antoine Nicolo, one of the local millers. He was taken to his mill, the Savvy Mill, which was nearby. Why? Why did they do this? Well, because the girls all became frightened at Bernadette's ecstatic countenance. As the miller himself later reported, she was smiling and her face was lovely, lovelier than anything I've ever seen. The children were shocked. Who is this person? It's no longer Bernadette. Not surprisingly, the mother came running with a stick and forbade her to go again. Always obedient and submissive to authority, even when punished without just cause, the little visionary dutifully, dutifully tried to put the grotto and its lady out of her mind. She was told never to go there again. So she tried to put it out of her mind. She tried to be obedient. And so all seemed done with. All was over. All was lost. Until that is a few days later, when one of the leading ladies of the town, Madame Mier, insisted that Bernadette return to the cave with her. Now, why did she want this? Because this devout woman and her confidant thought that the beautiful lady might be Madame Mie's deceased relative, Elisa, who died a year before in the odor of sanctity. They thought this young lady, Elisa, holy as she was, might still be in purgatory and had returned to beg for help. Clearly, the piety of these women in fulfilling their duty toward the poor souls in purgatory played an important role in keeping the Lord's apparition alive. They were all but over with. Bernadette was going to obey her mother, never go back to the grotto again. But this thing about purgatory rose up. Surely, 
It is also not insignificant how these devout women of Lourdes did not hesitate, did not hesitate to think even the holy Elisa, whose happy death impressed everyone, might still have debts to pay. That she might still be in purgatory. That God surely had discovered things that were hidden, just like we heard in the Maccabees. And they praised his just judgment. Here's an echo then of the Maccabees, that even though the men had fallen asleep in godliness, fighting for God's cause, a hidden fault was later discovered, that they had worn charms under their armor. What did the piety of the great general Judas Maccabeus demand? That they send offerings to Jerusalem and have sacrifices made for them. Thus we heard the scriptures conclude, it is a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead, that they may be loosed from sins. So, we see true piety, true piety prays and offers sacrifices for the poor souls of purgatory. As it is among our duties as Catholics to pray for the dead. Not just to bury them, but to pray for them. This is one of our duties. Well, some years later, St. Bernadette would say of herself when she was in the convent, When I am dead, people will say, she saw Our Lady. She's a saint. But meanwhile, I shall be roasting in purgatory. St. Bernadette, quotation. How right she was. How many today have no true piety, no godliness toward the deceased and fail to pray for them, thinking them all to be in heaven safe and sound. This is rationalism at work, folks. It may not seem like it at first, but it is. Where we make God think like us. You see that? People today in their impiety cannot see why God would hold someone up from entering into paradise. Because they themselves cannot see any reason for doing so. I can't see any reason for it. Therefore, God must not have any reason for it. That's rationalism. That's, you God, you think like me. I demand it. This is impiety. This is rationalism. We are not God. We do not understand his keen and unerring justice. This impiety is what Our Lady came to counteract at Lourdes. In fact, it seems that the good people of Lourdes found a way to prevent this impertinence from taking place among them. They added a sixth decade to their rosary. If you look at this statue or any statue of a traditional statue of Our Lady of Lourdes, you will find a sixth decade rosary on Our Lady's arm. Why? That extra decade is for the holy souls, the poor souls. In purgatory, if you look at traditional statues, that's what you'll discover. This is very significant. But before we look a little deeper into this matter, let us first define what piety is all about. I've been mentioning this word. I've kind of hinted at it, what it means. Let us wrap our minds around this very important concept, this virtue, this gift of the Holy Ghost. Something that St. Ambrose wrote about as the foundation of all virtue. That's an incredible statement. He says, Pietas virtutum omnium fundamentum. Piety is the foundation of all virtue. Now, please bear with me here because we're going to cover a lot of bases in, uh, in a short space. We're going to unpack it all week. But I think it's important we wrap our minds around it now and then we can kind of start to work with what piety is. And I hope that you see why I'm doing this because I honestly think this is something that needs to be taught more today than ever before. Because we have lost our verticality. We are in grave danger right now. There's way too much horizontal going on in the world, including among those who are traditional. And I hope to expose that as we go along. Okay, piety, godliness. What is this special virtue and gift? Well, let's begin. Piety begets in our hearts a filial affection 
for God as our most loving Father. Piety knows its end, in other words, is to be with God and all his saints in heaven forever. St. Paul teaches that godliness, pietas, is profitable to all things, having promise of the life that now is and that which is to come. Godliness, therefore, is always seeking to make us what? Look up. If you're pious, you're always measuring things in terms of the end. In terms of God and heaven and the saints. In maintaining this most profitable verticality, true piety enables us to see all things with the eyes of God. Acknowledging the truth as he sees it and knows it. What does St. Paul say? Titus is the first verse in the letter to Titus. The acknowledging of the truth, which is according to godliness. Unhesitating and fervent piety, therefore, is detached and ready to abandon its most cherished ideas the moment it discovers them to be in any way out of harmony with the church and her perennial teaching. That is important. Many people today are attached to something they can't let go. But once they're pious, they say, you know what? This is not how God sees things. I'm letting go of this. Piety seeks not its own special findings, but what can be gathered from the deposit of the faith. As presented by the church and her fathers and her doctors, since the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it looks back all the way to the time of Christ. So devout and faithful theologians have always used godliness, piety, as a principle in all their writings, saying, I said it earlier today, we'll say it again. In theology, there is no place for anything which does not foster piety. That means piety in instinctively and naturally repels novelties and innovations. If it's alive in you, you'll feel something. This is not right. This is a novelty. This is an innovation. On the other hand, it will lovingly and embrace all things traditional, even if it doesn't like them in its body. It makes them uncomfortable in the sense I have to kneel, I have to do these difficult things. I don't care. This is what they've always done. That's why I'm going to do it. When they first come to the traditional mass, I don't get it. I don't care. This is what they've always done. I'm going to do it. And it'll come. It's piety that makes them stick in there and not give up. What is more, piety inspires us to love, to reverence and respect. This is hard. This is the rub. The love and to reverence and to respect and to submit to and obey for God's sake. That's the key line. Persons and things consecrated to him. I'm going to obey them. I'm going to reverence them for his sake. Reverence those that are vested with his authority, including his blessed mother, the saints, the church, her visible leaders, the pope, the bishops, the priests our parents, our superiors, as well as our country and its rulers. Godliness seeks to make the soul subject to higher powers, says St. Paul, for there is no power but from God. And those that are, are ordained by God. This is Romans chapter 13. Therefore, he that resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist purchase to themselves damnation. St. Paul, Romans 13. In this way, godliness, God. It sees God, the Father, standing as it were behind each office and each office holder, regardless of the individual's personal worth or value. We're going to talk about that. It doesn't matter. This person's holding a legitimate office. Therefore, somehow, God has allowed it. He's standing behind this person. And my godliness says, respect him. 
reverence Him. What am I doing? I'm reverencing Him for God's sake. I'm seeing God standing right behind Him. That's piety. This includes office holders of the church. This includes the family and the land ever seeking to honor and worship God present there. It looks to those that are above to see what is superior in them and honoring that which is superior, wanting to make themselves superior in the process. It looks upon those below in order to help them overcome any obstacle in serving God, the object of our true virtue, our true love. In this way, we can see that any flattening, this is so important. If you can get your mind around this one statement, you're going to understand a lot about piety. Any flattening, any inverting of God's hierarchical order found in creation and His church deflates and attacks true godliness. And you feel it. You feel that deflation and it hurts. Piety is verticality. Alive then is the pious soul to whatever is pleasing to God and whatever may add to His glory and honor regardless of our personal feelings and disposition. To discover and embrace all things pleasing to the Lord, it is piety that opens the gates of the heavenly pastures and enters in to feed, ever seeking to map out all our duties owed to God and man. And fulfill them unto perfection. We're going to talk about that later this week. Never satisfied with minimal observance. God in us seeks to measure the inside of God's temple. To count its towers. To master its streets. To do this it rightly looks upon those who have gone before. With filial affection. Ever seeking to know and imitate the good they have done. What have our forefathers done? What have the saints done? I want to know. That's piety. True piety, therefore, is self-effacing and ever-resisting and subduing self-love. All the while inclining it to love God and neighbor with true and heartfelt affection. In this way, godliness inclines the soul to love God's creation and see all men as potential members of His holy church. It forgives injuries and makes excuses for offenses whenever possible. Always having compassion on the poor. Once again, anything that's below it, it wants to help it overcome any obstacles so they can go higher. Whatever is above it, it wants to be like it so it can become superior. See the verticality. It wants all men to adore the Lord and be healed of their sins and misery. Piety nourishes within the soul sorrow and compunction for whatever may get in the way of efforts to maintain verticality. Thus, the pious soul laments its own sins and those of the whole world sighing, ever sighing over all the pains and agonies these evils have caused our Redeemer and our Savior ever striving to prevent them from being repeated. In this way, St. Paul indicates piety is profitable in that it pays debts and it expiates sins. A little bit more. Oh, what a treasure then is God in us in overcoming our selfish and corrupt hearts, in erasing sins, in making heaven hear our pleas, and avoiding all error. He who is filled with piety finds the practice of his religion not a burdensome duty at all, but a delightful service. Where there is love, there is no labor. The prayers of the pious pierce the heavens and are readily heard on high, making it the backbone of the spiritual life, preventing us from slouching into lukewarmness and sin. This is the godliness needed to make us look up to God as well as to look back even unto His coming among us as a man, the human nature, to the virgin, 
bringing the two together to form the cross. Piety, therefore, leads the faithful soul to take up the cross. Thus the apostle exhorts us, exercise thyself unto godliness. O Lord, make us pious and we shall be pious. I hope you see that there is great value in this virtue. The verticality it offers to maintain is extremely important at this time when so much leveling is going on. Okay, St. Bernadette started with Potty and her first vision of the Blessed Virgin. This is seen by her godly instinct to what? Kneel down, to reach for her rosary. But she needed to improve. And so when she tried to make the sign of the cross, she failed. She had to wait for the lady to make the sign of the cross as her superior. What is more, the lady needed to teach her how to do it properly. There's the verticality. I'm above you. I'm going to teach you how to get more superior yourself. Follow me. Watch me. I'll teach you. What is more, our lady needed to show her how to do it properly. As I just said, make the sign of the cross just so. From that time on, Bernadette's piety began to deepen. Many noted how well and devoutly she always signed herself thereafter. Later in her life, she corrected a fellow nun on how to make the sign of the cross. The sister answered that certainly she did not make it as well as Bernadette did. After all, the little saint had been taught by the Blessed Virgin herself. Nevertheless, St. Bernadette responded, You must think of what you are doing then, because it is so very important to know how to make the sign of the cross fervently. How right she is. Childhood friend said of her, she made the signs of reverence with her hands and her head during the apparitions. It was a pleasure to see her as if all her life she'd done nothing else but learn how to do those greetings. All I could do was look at her. Many wept at seeing her make these special signs of reverence to the mother of God. Once when she was made sacristan in the convent of Nevers, a sister reached out to touch a purificator used at the Holy Mass. But she was stopped by the saintly nun who said, you have not reached that stage. Your piety is not deep enough. Let me help you become more superior. Bernadette then took the purificator and with great respect and replaced it into the purse. The sister went on to observe that one had the impression that when she touched these objects with such respect, she also prayed. Can you imagine having a teacher like Bernadette? Her piety extended to others as well. Thus, one sister writes of her at Lourdes. When I was in class with Bernadette, my companions and I noticed that she usually chose to go with the poor children. I knew that she would have liked to have served the poor, she told me that the vocation of a sister of charity was precious because it gave one the opportunity of comforting the poor. Once she said to another, if you are sent to a hospital, don't forget to see our Lord in the person of the poor patients. And the more repelling they are, the more you must love them. Now, what then of the poor souls in purgatory? They are the poorest of all as they have no funds by which to pay their debts. That is why we call them poor souls. Not so much because we should pity them, but because they have no way to pay their debts down, no profits, no way to make profits or merits to pay down their debts. Piety demands that we not forget them. We are above them. We're on the surface of the earth. They're under the earth. They need our help. Piety demands that we help those below us. In fact, piety, knowing its end, sees us taking our place among them someday. And then how much will we appreciate that six-decade rosary of Lourdes? 
Now, speaking of that rosary, recall that among the very first words of the Immaculate Mother of God spoken to Bernadette were, Will you do me the kindness of coming here for a fortnight? Well, counting the very day this heavenly request was made, that makes 15 total. Why 15? She had to come 15 days in a row. Well, 15 days for 15 mysteries of the Holy Rosary. One day for each decade. Let us not forget that there's also 15 promises for those who pray the Holy Rosary. Among them, I shall deliver from purgatory those who have been devoted to the rosary. That's a promise of those who pray the rosary. Now, in those 15 days at Lourdes is contained, at least in kernel form, all that is required for mankind and world around him to be healed. All that's needed to be healed is contained in those 15 days and the 15 decades of the rosary to be delivered from everything displeasing to God of all impiety. Now this makes perfect sense when we stop and think about it. If the 15 days of Lourdes really represent the 15 mysteries of the rosary, then all the mysteries of our salvation, all that man needs to be healed of his spiritual corporeal troubles are found therein. The joyful, sorrowful, and glorious mysteries. Is anything missing? No. The rosary came from above. It came from Our Lady. And it is complete. The closing prayer said at the Angelus captures this truth very well. You know it by heart. Pour forth, we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son was made known by the message of an angel, joyful mysteries, may by his passion and cross, sorrowful mysteries, be brought to the glory of his resurrections, glorious mysteries, through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. There it is. Everything that's needed is right there. Again, when St. Bernadette first saw the most beautiful and immaculate virgin appear in the niche of the grotto on that cool February 11, it did not take her long to kneel down and pull out her rosary. In doing this, she entered upon the path of perfect spiritual health. When she said fiat, yes, to Our Lady's request on February 18, the first of the 15 days, she committed to total purification. Spirit, soul, and body. And look where it ended. She is one of the church's finest, most stunningly beautiful incorruptibles. Her body remains miraculously preserved and intact as a sign of her future resurrection as a sign of the effects of true godliness working in her admirable life. Yet this did not come about except through many earthly trials. Sometimes I think people want healing. That means no suffering. They want to be in heaven already. We're not there yet. So we ask ourselves, are these trials damaging the souls? Are they displeasing to God? She died of consumption. She had a tumor on her knee. No, Bernadette's beautiful countenance, still visible for all to see in the convent of Nevers, shows this to be true. If this were true, if these are displeasing to God, if they're damaging to souls, no, she wouldn't be incorrupt then. If you seek to be free of earthly trials, in other words, you're seeking to be free of your cross in life. You've entered along the wrong path. You're going the wrong way. And this is the way the devils go because they hate the cross. They hate suffering. And they want us to hate it too. Had Bernadette done this, surely her body would have fallen into corruption. What we must seek is to be free of error, sin. And all that leads to sin. To be free of everything that is displeasing to our Lord and King and His Immaculate Mother. So not surprisingly, therefore, at the acquiescence of Bernadette to go the fortnight of visits, the most beautiful lady responded, I do not promise you happiness in this life, but in the next. Total purification, enter the 15 days, but I don't promise you happiness in this, in this life, but in the next. As Catholics, we embrace our cross. We love our cross. 
If we don't, we should pray for it. That's why we have the stations, why we have the sorrowful mysteries. But once again, all that is required to be healed unto eternal life, to be purified of this world and all things displeasing to God are found in the 15 mysteries of the rosary. In some way, therefore, they're also found in the 15 days of Bernadette's visit to the grotto. We put in the back of the church a breakdown of the 15 days and how each day lines up perfectly in some ways with one of the mysteries. Please take one of these home with you and read it. Now, what happens if we do not finish the job as she did? What happens when we do not enter into these mysteries as the Immaculate Virgin had asked? What happens if we don't persevere in going to the cave to be with Our Lady, to gaze upon her loveliness, come what may? Once again... The answer is found in that extra decade added on by the people of Lourdes. That's the answer. The extra decade is set aside for the poor souls in purgatory. That's what happens to those who do not fully embrace the 15 mysteries. They must attend to what is left off by going to that place of painful purgation, to that most trying oven of purifying fire where the dross of sin is melted out of the gold and silver of our souls. In a way, both the home of Bernadette and the grotto signify this. They're both caves of sorts. Bernadette's family lived as a last resort in the cave of the Cachot, which was previously one of the town's Jails. It was a cell for the jail. They were forced to flee there out of desperation. As we know, Our Lady likewise appeared to her confidant, Bernadette, from the cave-like niche above the grotto. Not surprisingly, purgatory is the cavern of last resort. It is a jail from which we will not be released until we pay the last penny to satisfy the keen and unerring justice of God. Piety makes us embrace this punishment even in this life, making us see things according to God's light, not our own. Everyone in purgatory is utterly pious, fully accepting and embracing this keen and unwavering judgment of God. They want only to do one thing, to please God. And they have things in them that are not pleasing to God and that causes them great pain. Their bodies are long gone. They see their soul unveiled. And they see all that is wrong with it, clearly. And it really hurts. By taking full advantage of these caves on earth, it seems that Bernadette finished her purgatory in this life. Perhaps this too is symbolized in the fact that her very last apparition took place some months after the 15 days were over. On July 16, the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. This signified not only the importance of always wearing the brown scapular in order to have the protection of the most powerful virgin, but also of Our Lady of Mount Carmel would not let her fall into the cave of purgatory. That's one of the promises that she would at least get her out on the following Saturday, not remain there long. And not surprisingly then, St. Bernadette always wore a brown scapular. When we examine the 15 days she visited the grotto, we learn how she had to overcome much opposition, both on the inside of herself as well as the outside. We've already mentioned some of them. She had to face resistance from the good requested by God's Holy Mother, not only from her own family, her friends, her relatives, her teachers and priests, but also from the secular world, the scientists. They gave her a hard time. Journalists, government officials of all ranks. At times, she had to overcome nearly all of them at once such as happened with the jeering crowds that felt disappointed after her digging and drinking of the muddy waters in the back of the grotto. But most of all, she had to overcome herself. When the lady did not appear 
with what corresponded to the fifth decade of the joyful mysteries, which was the finding of Jesus in the temple. As well as the fourth decade of the sorrowful mysteries, the carrying of the cross. Our lady said, come here. She didn't say, I will always be here. She says, you come here. And so she came and there was no lady. Remember that the lady asked Bernadette to come to the grotto for 15 days. She never agreed herself to come, always. Yet the humble and pious little seer passed through all of these trials and much more to become that incorruptible Bernadette that we love so much. Always repeating, I do not promise you happiness in this life, but only the next. In these moments when the lady did not appear, these moments of self-consternation and searching of her heart, it seems that the little visionary most represented what purgatory is like. And she was deeply concerned that she had offended the lady in some way. All she could think of is, what have I done to upset the lady, to hurt the lady? And she said, I want to die rather than hurt her. All she could think of was her offenses and sins toward that most majestic woman of the niche, leading her to prefer death than ever to do anything to add to these offenses again. Would that we had that level of piety. We would not hesitate to follow Bernadette in embracing the 15 mysteries of the rosary. When we finally do, we have the chance to do our purgatory here and now. By overcoming all internal opposition to the good God commands and the good commanded by His Holy Church and His Holy Mother. Now, applying this directly to our lives, let's make a practical application right now. The times of the Lady not appearing can symbolize the times of distraction during our prayer. That praying the rosary is not always easy. It's not always consoling. Nevertheless, keep praying. Maybe slow down a little bit. Sometimes I think people pray the rosary too fast. And this means that you're in the 15 days if you have these problems. You're in the 15 days. There are two times she didn't appear. It was not consoling. It was troubling. Bernadette still prayed the rosary. Do what Bernadette did. Seek to discover and overcome anything that may be displeasing to the lady. Listen to St. John of the Cross. He says, The fires of purgatory would have no power over faithful souls, even though they came into contact with it, if they had no imperfections for which to suffer. These are the material upon which the fire of purgatory ceases. When the material is consumed, there is not else that can burn. Yet piety always seeks to do what? Go the extra mile. We mentioned that. It strives to have the mind of Christ, to be perfect even as the Heavenly Father is perfect. Thus, even later in life, after long purgation, St. Bernadette her godliness dictated that she still had something to burn in those flames. She said, I will be in purgatory roasting and no one will pray for me. And she died saying, pray for me, a poor sinner. Wow. And then her face glowed with light after death. But the saints attest to the validity of St. Bernadette's pious sentiment. In the life of St. Teresa of Jesus, we read about a certain Don Bernardino de Mendoza, the brother of the Bishop of Avila at the time. He offered the foundress an excellent house for a Carmelite foundation in Valladolid. But before he could make the foundation, circumstances were such that she had to make one in Malagon first. But as she was completing the latter foundation, Don Bernardino suddenly died, and this happened not long after he recovered from a rather frivolous life. Part of his recovery involved the foundation of Valladolid. So, at first, St. Teresa hesitated and stayed some time where she was, at Malagon. But our Lord called her piety into order. He said to her, You're leaving a soul to linger, suffering in purgatory. And so she set off with all possible speed to Valladolid. Even though nothing was ready for the foundation there, our Lord urged her on. This soul is suffering greatly. 
He indicated that Don Bernardino would not go to heaven until the day the first Mass was said at the new house. And so it happened at the first Mass offered in the new Carmel, at the communion of the faithful, the priest holding up the host. Behind the priest, she saw Don Bernardino, his face resplendent with joy, come up out of the ground and rise up to heaven, thanking her on this way. At this wondrous sight, St. Teresa was caught up in a heavenly rapture. Notice where he came from, out of the ground. Once when a lady was leaving the confessional of St. John Vianney, he called her back and asked her if she had prayed hard for her previous confessor, who had passed away some three months earlier. Turns out that after a few weeks, this former penitent of his, feeling at rest about the holy man's salvation, ceased to pray for him. She made no mention of him to the curé in the confessional. But Father, she replied, I have ceased to pray for him because I believe he is in heaven. No, my child. Since he died, he's suffering in purgatory. Oh, Father, surely it's not possible. Yes, he said. He's still suffering because he was too indulgent to his penitence. Continue to pray for him. One lady accompanied her cousin on a pilgrimage to ours, only to hear the curé in her confessional say these amazing words. Thank your cousin, my child for having brought you to ours, but for her, you would be in hell. Wherever she was going, she probably would have died in a state of sin. He told her that. After mentioning the reasons, he added, Now see, my child, how ungrateful we are. Your father has been suffering in purgatory for ten years. Although you enjoy his possessions, you never dream of offering one mass which would deliver him. There's a monastery not far from here, Clear Creek. They do Gregorian Masses. If someone dies and leaves you an inheritance, please have a Gregorian Mass said first thing from the top of the inheritance. This is a failure in godliness if we don't. When the cousin heard this, she intended to ask the curé about her grandmother. But the curé answered her first, saying, Your grandmother, my child, does not need your prayers. It is she who is praying for you. She was a saint. She did not even go through the fires of purgatory. Thus, we're shown that we can bypass purgatory when we embrace those 15 days, those 15 decades. That should be our aim. Fully embrace the mysteries. We won't need that extra one of lures. But it seems the purgatory was an open book for the curé. If he had a mass to say for a sick person or for the poor souls in purgatory, he would always choose the poor souls. Here's what he said in one of his sermons. Alas, my dear brethren, what then will be the number of years which we shall have to suffer in purgatory? We who have so many sins, we who under the pretext that we have confessed them do no penance and shed no tears. Confession is not enough. We must also expiate the damage caused by sin. The curé goes on. My dear brethren, it is an article of faith. If we have not done penance proportionate to the greatness and enormity of our sins, even though forgiven in the holy tribunal of penance, we shall be compelled to expiate them. In Holy Scripture, there are many texts which show clearly that although our sins may be forgiven, God still imposes on us the obligation to suffer in this world by temporal hardships or in the next by the flames of purgatory. The fire of purgatory is the same as the fire of hell. The difference between them is that the fire of purgatory is not everlasting. Then the curé give multiple examples from the lives of the saints. Listen to this one. St. Peter Damien tells that his sister remained several years in purgatory because she had listened to an evil song with some pleasure. We are in big trouble, folks. This is the 11th century. 
it is told that two religious promised each other that the first to die would come to tell the survivor in what state he was. God permitted the one who died first to appear to his friend. He told him that he was remaining 15 years in purgatory for having liked his, to have his own way too much. We don't have that problem, right? And as his friend was complimenting him on remaining there for so short a time, the dead man replied, I would have much preferred to be flayed alive for 10,000 years continuously for that suffering could not even be compared with what I am suffering in these flames. Yikes. Here's what he says about Albert the Great, a man whose virtue shone in such an extraordinary way. Said on this matter of purgatory, he revealed one day from heaven to one of his friends that God had taken him to purgatory for having entertained a slightly self-satisfied thought about his own knowledge. St. Albert went to purgatory. St. Severinus, Archbishop of Cologne, appeared to one of his friends a long time after his death and told him that he had been in purgatory for having deferred to the evening the prayers he should have said in the morning. In the late 1800s, we find this church-approved event. A deceased father visited his daughter who recently entered a convent in Holland. In coming to her, he said, The rest of my children think I'm in heaven, and scarcely one of them now and then says a day profundis. That's Psalm 129. Says a day profundis for me. And this was really so, it turns out. His children thought he was in heaven and expressed themselves thus in a letter to the sister. Father died like a saint and he is now in heaven. How many times have we been told that? How often we suffer the same delusion concerning the fate of our dear ones. This is a failure in piety, folks. Poor father, the sister replied, I am entirely at your service. You may trouble me at will if only the rest of the community are not disturbed. I will have many prayers said for you. Tell me what you particularly desire. He responded, I wish that ten masses be celebrated and that the stations of the cross be visited often for me. The sister asked him whether her mother was still in purgatory. No, on entering eternity, I was informed that she went straight to heaven after her death. You sacrificed your health by nursing her in her last illness. And now I am coming to trouble you for my deliverance. Once again, it's possible to bypass purgatory and go straight to heaven. It is a holy and pious thought to pray for the dead, especially, especially our parents, our priests. Even after long years of incredible suffering, if you've not read about it, please do. St. Lydwin of Shidem. She had many visits to purgatory herself of helping many get out of that divine jail. She was a victim soul of the 15th century. 38 years on her bed of pain. Had no confidence that she herself would not go through its purifying fires. Thus she prayed, quote, Grant me this last grace to suffer as much as I deserve so that at last, exonerated from living, I may be admitted without passing through purgatory to the contemplation of thy most adorable face, end quote. Wow. 38 years in incredible pain, and she was still worried about going to purgatory. That's piety. What foolishness, what impiety to think that we and others do not have imperfections upon which the fires of purgatory must Sees if we are to rise to heaven. The saints like Bernadette clearly show us if we think we have no imperfections, that in itself is an imperfection. And one wonders how much roasting is going to be required to clear out that one imperfection before we can be cleansed of others. Recall St. Peter's shame when he realized the proximity of God at the catch of the fish, coupled with his own unworthiness. The gospel says, when Simon Peter saw the miraculous catch of fish, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Now think about it. 
Dearly beloved, if we have trouble facing others on earth when we have offended them, just think about it. It's hard to look someone in the eyes when we've offended them. We avoid them. We run away. Then how much more shall we feel the need to flee, to fling ourselves into purgatory in the searching presence of the infinite God? Thus, St. Ephraim says, 4th century doctor of the church, he exhorted his friends, I beseech you, my brethren and friends, in the name of God who commands me to leave you, to remember me when you assemble to pray. Do not bury me with perfumes. Give them not to me, but to God. Me, conceived in sorrows, bury with lamentations, and instead of perfumes, assist me with your prayers. For the dead are benefited by the prayers of the living saints. Let us flee from the flooding river of rationalism which tries to bring God down to our level and demands that He act as we would want Him or expect Him to act. Instead of this impiety, here is what we must do as dutiful and godly Catholics. Number one. Wear our brown scapulars always and put them on our dying friends and relatives when we're able. Don't let your friend or parent die without the brown scapular. Second, give alms. That's a precept of the church. Look how quickly giving alms helped Don Bernardino to get out of purgatory after a frivolous life. When St. John the Baptist heard confessions, he gave this advice. He that hath two coats, let him give him to that hath none. Give alms. Third, aid as much as possible the poor souls in purgatory, especially our deceased priests, parents, family, and benefactors, by having masses offered for them and earning indulgences for them, that their sins may be forgiven. To do this, we must go to confession frequently. Every other week is ideal. To get a plenary indulgence, you've got to go to confession every 16 days. Attend the Holy Mass more than just once a week when possible. Perform indulged acts such as praying the family rosary, making the stations of the cross, meditating on the sacred scriptures. These are plenary indulged acts all of which have the possibility of helping souls get out of purgatory. When we rise up in the morning, pray in our Father, hell, Mary, and the glory be for the traditional intentions of the Holy Father with the intention of earning as many indulgences as possible for that day. Have that in mind. I want to get as many indulgences as possible for today. How do I do that? Put your hand in the holy water and start right away. Make the sign of the cross with holy water. That's indulged. Kiss your brown scapular. That too is indulged. Number four, we should remember that purgatory is down. Down in the earth. They're looking up to us for help. We should therefore be piously praying for them rather than to them. When you're in purgatory, you're going to want people to pray for you. The heavenly saints are the intercessors. There's many reasons for that, but I encourage you not to pray to them, but to pray for them. If the poor souls start to answer all our prayers while they're still in purgatory, we will stop praying for them. Hey, they're okay. Pray for them. Some hold that all we need to do is receive the last rites, to bypass purgatory. Now the sacraments certainly work and they can produce marvelous results, but they depend on us. They are received according to the disposition of the one receiving. The more devout and sorry the recipient is for their sins, the more the sacrament prepares him for avoiding purgatory. Yet there are many stories from the lives of the saints of those who had to go to purgatory after receiving extreme unction, even if only for a short time. St. Teresa recounts how a nun 
She received all the sacraments. Everybody thought she was going to go right to heaven. And then St. Teresa was told she was four days in purgatory. And she was surprised. She was so holy. St. Augustine said it very well. God made us without us, but He will not save us without us. Finally, it is our duty as Catholics to avoid going down there ourselves. God has graciously put the safety net of purgatory in place. But to be most pleasing to God, we must strive to become saints here and now and try to avoid that place. When this duty is fully and piously embraced, we too will share in that wonderful incorruption of St. Bernadette that is but a foretaste of the future resurrection. It is a holy and pious and wholesome thought to pray for the dead that they may be loosed from sins. Make us pious, O Lord, and we shall be pious. Thank you for coming but would you do me the kindness of coming four more nights? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.